to the X's and O's. This one is for UFC 300's main event headliner between Alex Pereira and Jamal Hill. So in this video, I'm going to be breaking down the key to victory for both guys. This is going to be an unbiased breakdown, and I'm going to lay out how I see the fight playing out if each guy were to win this matchup. Because when we look around the UFC light heavyweight division, I do believe that this is one of the best matchups the UFC could make. That's why they put this thing together as the headliner for UFC 300, because there was some talk about this potentially being the headliner for UFC 301. They had some main event headliner issues for 300. No doubt about it, this is a great style clash between two fantastic fighters. So first, when we look at the measurables and how these guys line up, what excites me is ever since Alex Pineda has moved up to light heavyweight, right? He's went up against some bigger guys and, and some of these different things. We saw him against Yuri Prohaska. We saw him against Jan Blachowicz. But in a matchup with Jamal Hill, this is a guy that matches up incredibly well with him. They're both 6'4". They both have a 79-inch reach. And they're very close in terms of leg reach, right? Because when we look at Pineda, he's a very long guy. He's tall. He's very lanky. But at, head, or at light heavyweight, we have seen that he doesn't have the exact same advantages that he did at 185. He is a little bit slower. He does, have still, he's, he does still have pretty good speed. But he is a little bit slower. He's not as lean. He's not as quick as he was at 185. And in a matchup with Jamal Hill, if we're looking around the light heavyweight division, there's not many guys that could really match the speed of a guy coming up from 185, but look no further than Jamal Hill. Because I believe in this matchup, guys, Jamal Hill is one of the biggest threats in the light heavyweight division to Alex Pineda's title reign. And I know that people can point out, well, we have Magomed Ankalaev who has the grappling and some of these different things, which I agree. But Jamal Hill, I know he's not a world-class kickboxer like Alex Pineda, but in terms of MMA striking, Jamal Hill's an absolute nightmare in, in a matchup against Alex Pineda. So we're going to get into what makes Jamal Hill so dangerous in this fight, right? I mean, hence the nickname Sweet Dreams. The way Jamal Hill gets this thing done, I believe whoever wins this fight, it's going to be within two rounds. I believe it's going to be a KO by one of these guys within two rounds. Because when we look at Jamal Hill, four fight win streak, seven wins by knockout, four first round finishes. So to note, if you're like, well, wait a minute, why does he not have the belt? He's on a four fight win streak. And all, well, Jamal Hill had to vacate the belt about a year ago. He, he's had an Achilles injury. So that's a question mark coming into this matchup, right? We've seen in the NBA, we've seen in the NFL when some of these guys, they tear their Achilles and they come back. And it's kind of a question mark of, well, what kind of athlete are we going to see? Are they the same guy? Are they going to be a little tentative and, and, and not cut loose? And, and some of those different things, can they move as well? But I believe that we're going to see a Jamal Hill that looks like the Jamal Hill we're used to, right? And Jamal Hill, he's no mystery to being a guy that's very adamant about, I'm not looking to grapple with anybody. I want to get in your face. I want to push you back up against the fence, and I want to let my hands go. That is exactly how Jamal Hill is going to win this fight. Jamal Hill, everyone just seems to think that Jamal Hill is just going to turn into some sort of Habib or some Dagestani wrestler coming into this matchup. It's not what he's going to do. He's not going to be putting on his wrestling shoes because something that a key piece that a lot of people miss, you know, everyone's like, well, Marlon Chidovera should have wrestled more against Sean O'Malley and hindsight's 2020. But when you're not used to coming into a fight and grappling, you know, so much for so long, you get very tired. And when you're in a matchup against a guy like Poetan Pineda, who's one of the highest level strikers Jamal Hill has ever faced, probably the highest, you don't want to blow your arms out and be tired from grappling when you got this world-class kickboxer standing in front of you. I don't believe that's going to be Jamal Hill's game plan. I do think that he will faint level changes. I do think that he may look to, you know, clinch up, get a hold of Alex, hold him up against the fence, try and wear on him a little bit, land some good dirty boxing combinations in close. But I don't think we see a grappling. We don't see much grappling in this matchup. I do believe that this is going to be a kickboxing fight. Now let's get into a little bit of, you know, what we're looking at here in terms of the stats with Jamal Hill. I'm not a huge numbers guy, right? I know numbers do tell, they do paint somewhat of a picture for us, but they don't paint the full picture, right? Because when we look at, you know, football, for example, if a quarterback had three interceptions in a game, well, two of those bounced off the receiver's hands. Were they really three interceptions by the quarterback? We do see that in fighting a lot, right? We see it. We look at some of the numbers here. We see a 73% takedown defense from Jamal Hill, you know, and overall 55% striking accuracy. So when we when you see that, you're like, oh, well, only half of his shots land. But yeah, Jamal Hill's 12 and one, and he's knocking people out left and right, and he's on a four fight uh, win streak, right? So Jamal Hill, and I do want to point out his only loss was to Paul Craig. You got to say Craig, right? You know, it's not Craig, Craig. <laughs> and the reason he lost an armbar. 
You know, he was in Paul Craig's guard. Craig got, you know, postured up, landed, you know, trapped him in an arm bar. Beautiful transition work by Paul Craig. Boom, caught him, broke his arm. Beautiful submission by Paul Craig. Outside of that, Jamal Hill has been pretty dominant. You know, we saw the Glover Teixeira matchup, you know, back in Brazil where Hill won the belt and Jamal Hill looked excellent in that matchup. Now you could say, well, Glover's a little bit older and th that's not fair to take that away from Jamal Hill in that aspect because Jamal Hill, you know, first of all, not his fault that Glover Teixeira was, you know, a little bit older in his career and Glover Teixeira was just coming off some crazy fights. Goes out there, beats Jan Blachowicz, wins the belt, you know, the oldest guy I think to win a UFC uh, title. Then he goes out there against Yuri Prohaska, was winning the fight, was not far off from winning and then gets submitted by Yuri, comes back, you know, so just all of these different things. Jamal Hill has been really good since he's been in the UFC and I know people want to point out some of the antics with his brother and some of the off the field issues he's been having. Jamal Hill's a sensational fighter, guys. He is absolutely dangerous. And when we look at this stat here, right, this is incredibly impressive. Now, some of the X's and O's that I've already done, I'll link that one down in the description for Oliveira versus Armand Sarukian. This stat right here is beyond impressive because if you watch that one and you see the stat line that I break down in that one, Jamal Hill is he's landing more significant strikes than guys that are at lightweight. Let me, let me say that again. Jamal Hill is landing 7.3 strikes per minute. Significant strikes. Not, oh, he landed a jab or he leg kicked somebody. No, a significant strike that hurt somebody. That that really had some, some oomph behind it. Jamal Hill landing 7.3 per minute. That's higher than in the X's and O's that I've been doing, even with Poirier and Saint Denis before that matchup happened. Those guys are at three or four. Seven? That's incredibly impressive. And then over here, Significant strikes absorbed per minute, 3.3. Now, anytime we see the significant strikes landed, you know, being more than half of what the strikes are absorbed, that's typically a good sign. Now, I will, you know, caution you coming into this matchup, one significant strike from Alex Pereira is potentially fight ending. So it's a little bit different, right? When we talk about heavyweights, light heavyweights, the power is different, obviously, than at lightweight and some of those other divisions. So that is something that we need to factor in. But nonetheless, that's really impressive by Jamal Hill. That means he's landing a lot of good shots and not taking a lot of damage, right? So we get into the takedown defense. No mystery. Jamal Hill is not really a grappler and he's not coming in the, into this matchup to grapple, I really don't believe. So, but when we look at, you know, the, the, the strikes by target, you know, 67% to the head, 25 to the body, eight to the leg. So why is that important? Jamal Hill head hunts a little bit. Now he does go to the body occasionally, but he's predominantly a head hunter. You don't want to be headhunting Alex Pineda in this matchup. You don't want to be doing that. You want to be mixing up. You want to scramble, you know, take out the driver a little bit. You want to scramble the brain of Alex Pineda. You don't want to just stand in there and allow him to pull counter and move his head off the center line, which he does a really good job of pulling his head out of the way and landing good shots. He leaves his hands down, tries to bait you into throwing things. But what, from what we've seen from Jamal Hill, he's got he's got really good power in his hands. He's got good he's got good MMA boxing. He has really sharp hands. He has good power in both hands, not just in the left hand. We saw what he was able to do to Johnny Walker. We saw that left high kick he was able to utilize against Glover Teixeira. I look for that to be a weapon in this matchup. Now, Alex Pineda is very good at blocking head kicks. So if I'm Jamal Hill, I'm looking to switch that up to the body and I'm looking to try to work some sort of, I know it's a little bit different because it's an open stance battle where Pineda's orthodox. Jamal Hill does switch at times, but we've seen him predominantly in that southpaw stance. It's a little bit different trying to beat up the lead leg. But if I'm Jamal Hill, if you're not working the lead leg of Pineda, I'm bringing that, that left high kick. Maybe you throw a couple or two just to keep him on alert. Bring that thing to the body. Try to work the body of Alex Pineda a little bit. Drill that left hand to the body. Get him to bring those hands down. Faint some level changes. Don't give Alex the ability. When you saw Alex against Sean Strickland, he was very comfortable because there was no threat of anything else other than the boxing. Don't just stand in front of Alex and give him one thing to think about. Mix up the tools in this matchup, which I do think Jamal Hill is going to do. And if he does that, he has a really good shot at winning this fight because as much as we're going to say that Alex Pineda is a super high-level kickboxer, which he is, two-time glory champ, he's fought at 185, 205, all those different things, he's very hittable. He's very hittable. He's there to be hit. And if Jamal Hill is able to back, back Alex Pineda up and keep him on the back foot for a majority, majority of this fight, I think Jamal Hill has a lot of success in this matchup. Now, 
I will say this, you have to be careful closing the distance because what Alex Pineda does, which we're going to get to Alex in just a second, he has some really sneaky things that he does to Southpaws that I do believe are going to cause a bit of an issue for Jamal Hill. But if I'm Jamal Hill in this matchup, you, you, you got to keep your hands up. You got to be defensively sound. And instead of just spamming high kicks up high like he was doing to Glover to share that was working, Glover's a little bit shorter, or Alex is going to be much taller. It's going to be harder to get that leg up there anyway. Bring that down to the body. Start to work the body of Alex. Try to get those hands dropping even more and then eventually look to counter over the top because we've seen Jamal Hill. When he decides to go for it and push forward and back you up against the fence and he lets his hands go, he's one of the most dangerous guys in the division, no question. So if Jamal Hill's going to get this thing done, I believe it's a knockout within two rounds. All right, moving on. Let's go to Alex Poetan Pereira. And the man whom this card was basically built around, right? Alex Pereira's had such an interesting rise since he's came into the UFC. He's one of the biggest stars we have at this point. You know, from the act of, you know, the whole bow and arrow, the, ah, you know, like everything that he has going on, the theatrics, he's done it right. Shama. You know, like all of those things. It's incredibly impressive how the guy barely speaks any English at all, is able to connect with all fan bases. Alex Pereira's a superstar. With all that being said, I really hope that he's taking Jamal uh, Jamal Hill incredibly serious because Jamal Hill, you know, he's fast. Alex Pineda is used to being faster than a lot of these other guys at light heavyweight. I don't think he's going to have that much of a speed advantage against Jamal Hill. In fact, Jamal Hill might actually be faster because ever since Alex moved up to one uh, to two hundred five. He looks a little bit fluffier, which is to be expected. He's not cutting as much weight. He's not as lean. And while he still has really good leg kicks, while he still is very dangerous, everything looks just a tad bit slower. And when we look at kind of what's went on for Alex Pereira in terms of, uh, of, of, you know, the stat line, seven wins by knockout, three first round finishes. So while as good as Alex Pereira is at knocking people out, Only three of those have been first round finishes. We saw, you know, his first fight in the UFC was against Andreas Mihailidis. We'll go down to that here, actually, and kind of take a look at a little bit of the history here. You know, first fight in the UFC, Andreas Mihailidis. It's it's at Madison Square Garden. It's his debut. A lot of nerves coming into that one. You know, first round gets taken down a little bit, held down, gets back to his feet, wastes no time, knocks out Mihailidis with a flying knee, goes out there in a three round fight against Bruno Silva, which Bruno Silva brought the fight to Alex Pineda, man. And something to note, Bruno Silva, a southpaw, okay? And then moving into this, you know, gets it by decision, goes up there against uh, Sean Strickland. They give him, Strickland was ranked number four at the time. We all knew the, the 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 strategy here. This was all about getting him a win and getting him to Izzy, okay? So he goes out there, knocks out Sean Strickland, goes out there in the fifth round after he's losing to Adesanya, the adversity that he faced in that matchup, wins the rematch, loses to Izzy, Then makes the move to 205. Goes up first bout. By the way, Jan Blachowicz, that's a really hard fight at light heavyweight, guys. That's a really hard fight. In your MMA light heavyweight debut, you go in there against Jan Blachowicz, who in a way was kind of a hard matchup because Jan Blachowicz does have good grappling. He's not known for going out there, putting on his wrestling shoes and just shooting takedown after takedown, but he has good submissions. He has really good leg kick defense. And overall, he's got crazy power. When Jan Blachowicz decides to move forward and throw combinations, we, we've seen him leave footprints on people like Dominic Reyes from just from the brute power of the Polish Jan Blachowicz. Then he goes out there against uh, Yuri Prochaska. I know everyone's talking about the early stoppage, but nonetheless, impressive performance by Pineda. It was the first time we saw Yuri coming back from the injury. Just a lot of different things going on. But the note of both of these light heavyweight matchups the leg kicks of Alex Pineda, even back to the Izzy fight, were an absolute key piece for Alex Pineda to be successful. And if he's going to have success against Jamal Hill, he's going to need to get those leg kicks going. Now, I would like to mention, that's going to change with Jamal Hill being a southpaw. I don't think Jamal Hill's going to, going to operate out of the orthodox stance a lot. I know we've seen him switch back and forth from Jamal Hill. I'm not doing that at all because if you switch to orthodox, Alex is a very, very high Q. Uh, he has a very high fight IQ. A lot of people just look at him as this Michael Myers stone faced guy who's just this dumb dumb that happens to have a lot of power and be a genetic freak, which that's part of it. But this guy has incredibly high fight IQ and he is setting you up with everything that he does. And he knows Jamal Hill is not a comfortable guy 
when he switches to that orthodox stance. Despite him using it, it's all offense. He's not very defensively sound. So Alex is just going to blast those calf kicks if he switches to orthodox. So I don't think we're going to see Jamal Hill do that. So with Jamal Hill being a southpaw, it's that open stance battle that I referenced before for Jamal Hill, where now it becomes a switch kick to, to, to the lead leg. And while Alex is very, very good at that as well, it doesn't have the same power. And you are going to be a little bit more out of position than when you are throwing your rear, rear, uh, rear leg. So whenever Jamal Hill sees him do that, that's going to be the opportunity for, for Hill to step in and throw a good straight left hand right down the middle. And that's what I believe Jamal Hill is going to look to do. He's going to look to try to counter the kicks of Alex Pineda. Now, Jamal Hill is very bladed and he's very heavy on that lead leg. So Alex is absolutely going to look to, to beat up that lead leg of Jamal Hill and hinder some of the movement and take away some of that explosiveness that Jamal Hill possesses. But if we look here at the significant strikes by target, this is quite a bit different than what we saw from Jamal Hill, right? I mean, Alex Pineda, 42% to the head, 33% to the body, 25% to the leg. I love the target mix up here from Alex Pineda. I love how he mixes things up. This right here, ladies and gentlemen, this is called scrambling the brain, right? I know there's not a takedown threat from Pineda. You don't know where he's going. You know, he's beating you up with the jab. Then he throws a good straight right hand to the body. Then he throws a, he throws some kicks to the legs. Then he throws a head kick. Then he throws a kick to the body. Then he gets you in closest, throwing knees to the body. Then there's a left hook. Like, he's mixing everything up so you it, it constantly keeps you guessing. Then when we go over here, right, and we take a look at these numbers, this is where I get concerned if you're a numbers guy for Alex Pineda. Because while we saw Jamal Hill land seven point you know, over seven significant strikes per minute. Alex Pineda is at five. So it's like, okay, well, that's pretty close. But what scares me is this right here. 3.65 significant strikes uh, absorbed per minute. So when we, remember what I referenced to you before, five to 3.6, that's a little bit close for my liking, right? When we What we saw for Jamal Hill was over double. So we saw, you know, he had seven and then half of that was significant strike strikes absorbed. That's more of a category that I like to see. That means you're you're landing some good shots, but your movement is good and you're getting out of the way of some things. Whereas Alex Pineda, if I'm if I'm a, if I'm a guessing guy and I and I was going to give an educated guess at why these numbers look the way they do now, it's since he moved to light heavyweight because while he has won both of these fights guys, He's eaten some good shots from Jan Blahovich and Yuri Prohaska. He's been there to be countered, and he he's taken some shots. So to say that he's just this invincible guy where people are like, oh, well, he's a high-level kickboxer like Izzy. Yes, they are both two incredibly high-level strikers, but very different at the same time. They have a similar frame, a similar, they're they're long, they're tall, but Izzy is very defensively sound. He's very hard to get to where Alex is there to be hit. He likes to get in the phone booth. He doesn't utilize his reach as well as maybe he could, but he's had a lot of success throughout his career. So why really change what's working? But when we look at that, that's concerning. That's concerning because we know that Jamal Hill, he's not afraid to get in there and exchange, man. And he's been in, Jamal Hill's been saying, I'm going to knock this guy out. I'm not going to wrestle him. I'm not going to, and I do, I believe Jamal Hill. I think he's going to go in there and try and strike with this guy because why wouldn't you? If you're looking at the stats and you're looking at Jamal Hill's body of work and what he's been able to do on the feet, He's made some, not guys that are the level of Alex Pineda in terms of the striking, but he's made some pretty good MMA strikers in the light heavyweight division look pretty bad. We saw what he did to Johnny Walker, right? And Johnny Walker, I know he's not a world beater. He's very athletic and he's a wild man in there. And we saw what he was able to do to him. And then right here, Alex Pineda, striking accuracy, 62%. That's really high. That's higher than Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill was at, I believe, 55%. So Alex Pineda, when he's throwing, he's not looking so much for volume. He is planting on, he, he's just looking to launch, man. Everything that he throws is with is with bad intentions, even the leg kicks. He starts to kind of flick them out there in the beginning to get the timing. He just wants to touch that calf, beat up that leg a little bit, try to hinder the movement, and then eventually you get desperate. One of two things happens from Alex Pineda that we've seen. We've seen the route with Izzy Adesanya. If you want to play that movement game and move around and run away from me the whole time, that's fine, says Alex. He's like, I'm just going to beat up your leg and eventually you're not going to be able to move and I'm going to close you down and I'm going to knock you out. 
And then if you also want to be a little too aggressive and you want to play that game as well, I'll just beat up your leg. And then eventually you're going to get desperate. You're going to press forward, try to close me down. And I'm just going to counter you with my back up against the fence like he did to Yuri Prohaska. That's how Alex Pineda wins this matchup. Very, very, very simple. Now, two things that Alex Pineda does against Southpaws, we've seen. Back in LFA, he fought this guy named Powell with the last name Powell. And one of the things that Alex does very well is what? His best weapon is that left hook. Well, against a southpaw, you know, if you hear in boxing all the time, they tell you when you're in that open stance battle, southpaw, southpaw versus orthodox, you change the jab to a left hook. Check left hook, whatever. It's a lot harder to see coming over that shoulder than it is a jab straight down the middle. You can kind of roll that shoulder and block it where that left hook comes right around the line, the, the side, of, side of vision. It's just a little bit different. Alex is going to look to land that left hook. Now, what he does to set that up is he loves to drill that right hand to the body and then eventually come upstairs with that left hook. It's something he used in glory for a number of years, you know, drilling that right hand to the body. You duck, come down, left hook right over the top. Then he also, like when he knocked out Powell in LFA, he threw that right high kick, boom, you block it. And then as soon as you charge forward to try to counter, boom, left hook right over the top, right around that front shoulder, never even saw it coming, slept them bad. So guys, when we look at this matchup through and through, Jamal Hill is a real threat to Alex Pineda in this matchup. And I am going to lean towards Alex Pineda to get this thing done because I would like to believe if you come into a matchup with Poetan and you want to stand in front of him and you want to play this kickboxing matchup with him, there's not many guys that are going to be able to beat him. There's not many guys that are going to be able to beat him. And I know people are going to say, well, but look what Adesanya did. He was able to knock him out, you know? And that's true. But Jamal Hill's not Adesanya. Yes, he does have good power. Yes, he does have good hands. He does move pretty well. He's not Izzy, right? He's not Izzy. He doesn't sit back on the back foot, try to bait you in, all the feints, all the stand switching, all the different looks he gives. It's a little more straightforward with Jamal Hill. He's going to look to take the center, back you up, get you uncomfortable up against the fence, you know, back you into a corner, and then just launch and explode. With Alex Pineda, very simple. He's going to want to sit on the outside, beat up the lead legs of Jamal Hill, look to take away some of that movement, and look to ultimately land that left hook, the detonator in this case, to put out uh, Jamal Hill. And as Izzy said, it's going to be on Jamal Hill in this match because we've heard Izzy say when you face Pineda, it's defusing the bomb. And if Jamal Hill can go in there and avoid that left hook, I think Jamal Hill has a lot of success in this matchup. But I want to hear what you all think down in the comments. Early predictions, who are you leaning for, uh, leaning towards in this matchup at UFC 300? Uh, like this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already. I appreciate you all.